Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today I've got a different kind of video for you. It's not a benchmark video, though that will come shortly as I am currently testing the Ryzen 7 5800X 3D on various B350 and X370 boards, and the testing's going really well. In fact, it's going so well that it prompted me to go back and look at a few of my AMD versus Intel battles over the last few years, and while reading through the comments, I noticed a common theme amongst um, anti-Ryzen viewers, let's say. Now, for me, a big incentive to go with Ryzen was the AM4 platform support, but it would seem quite a few people didn't agree with that three to four years ago now. Uh, this is despite AMD promising platform support until at least 2020, and bar a small hiccup where they quickly reversed plans to axe support, it's been mostly smooth sailing. The plan as we understood it back in 2017 when Ryzen first burst onto the scene was that those investing in a 300 series AM4 motherboard would be able to upgrade to a second or third generation Ryzen CP or really anything released up to and including 2020. This was and still really is a seriously big deal and I can't overstate just how important this platform longevity was for the success of Ryzen. For years, consumers have been faced with Intel's TikTok strategy, which saw each socket only support two generations of CPUs, and then the following TOC generation was generally only a very minor improvement, if at all. So for example, if you bought a Sandy Bridge Core i3 processor in January of 2011 on an LJ1155 motherboard, and then two years later wanted to upgrade to say a Core i5-4670K, you'd need a new motherboard supporting the LJ1150 socket, despite the fact that both platforms used DDR3 memory. Unfortunately, to this day, Intel has stuck with this strategy. Fourth and fifth gen shared the LJ1150 socket, then sixth and seventh used the LJ1151 socket, and although eighth and ninth also used this same socket, they were 100% incompatible. Then 10th and 11th gen moved to LJ1200, and now 12th gen uses LJ1700, and this socket will likely be ended with the 13th gen later this year. What all of this means is, if we want to compare Intel CPUs released over the last five years, we need four individual test systems using different motherboards, though they all run the same DDR4 memory. Meanwhile, from AMD, we've been able to use a single test system, though admittedly BIOS support is a little bit tricky, but it does work, and it works well. For me, the broad platform support has been a massive win for AMD, and it's really a big reason why I've recommended Ryzen so many times in the past. However, as you might expect, over the years I have faced a lot of criticism for recommending AMD, though of course it does really go both ways. Recent recommendations of Intel's Adelaide processors have also caught their own blowback, but we're not here to discuss that today. Now, as I alluded to earlier in the past, I've often been criticized for highlighting AMD's commitment to AM4 as a real benefit, a, a key selling point of the uh, AMD Ryzen processors, and rebuttals from viewers who disagree with me. They go along the lines of, no one upgrades every generation or every second generation, so AM4's longer platform support is useless, it's not a key selling point, it benefits no one, Intel's better, so buy Intel. Something like that, there's been many variations of that comment. Uh, but yeah, they've been left on the CPU videos for years now, certainly less over the past year, but three to four years ago, this was a fairly common theme from those criticizing my Ryzen recommendations. In my opinion, this has always been wrong, and I'll explore why in a moment, but with the release of the Agisa 1207 microcode, which allows even 300 series boards, so B350, X370, it allows those boards to support the latest and greatest Zen 3 based processors, so the evidence for why that take is wrong is stronger than ever. Now, if we go back to 2017 when first gen Ryzen launched, budget enthusiast gamers had the choice of either the Core i5 7600K for roughly $240 US or the Ryzen 5 1600 for $220 US. The Ryzen CPU was slower in almost all of the games at the time, but it was around 80% faster for all core workloads thanks to a 50% increase in cores along with SMT support for three times as many threads. So it seemed pretty obvious to me that within a relatively short period of time, the R5 1600 would be the better gaming CPU. And within two years, it was. And today you can pick any relatively modern game and the Ryzen 5 1600 lays complete waste to the 7600K. 
The Core i7-7700K, 7, on the other hand, that has aged better relative to the Ryzen 7 7700, though whereas the Ryzen 7 part was generally heavily outperformed for gaming back in 2017, today they are very close, and for CPU-heavy games, the R7-1700 is generally faster. However, if you purchased either the Core i5-7600K or Core i7-7700K, or really any 7th gen part for that matter back in 2017, that was pretty much it. In order to secure more CPU performance with something like the Core i7-8700K, you would need an entirely new motherboard, and that can be very costly for a mid-range to high-end build. Meanwhile, going from the Ryzen 5 1600 to the Ryzen 7 3700X as an example, that didn't require a motherboard change, which is impressive given that's quite a substantial performance upgrade. However, B350 and X370 motherboards now support Ryzen 5000 series processors, meaning a relatively inexpensive but very powerful CPU such as the Ryzen 5 5600 is a drop-in upgrade from a five-year-old R5 1600 for just $175 US. So not only did the Ryzen 5 1600 last far longer than the Core i5 7600K as a viable gaming CPU, but it can now be upgraded without having to change the motherboard to a Zen 3 processor that enables substantially greater gaming performance and just really far greater performance in general. Actually, not that long ago, I put together a six core Zen GPU scaling video and found that when CPU limited, Zen 3 was on average 64% faster than Zen, comparing the 1600X and 5600X, and there were examples where performance more than doubled. So essentially, if you bought a Core i5 7600K in 2017, it would have been a struggle not to upgrade by the release of Intel's 10th gen series, landing something like a Core i5-10400F, for example, that was around $160 US, and then of course you do need a new motherboard, setting you back at least another $100 for something that really would have been pretty rubbish. On the other hand, the Ryzen 5 5600, that is a good bit faster than the 10400F, so to achieve a similar level of performance, you'd need the 12400F, which admittedly is a bit faster for gaming, but it's yet another motherboard change to get there. Therefore, I think looking back at all of this, it is fair to say at this point, if you bought into Ryzen back in 2017, you made the right choice. And I have to admit early on, I was a bit skeptical of Ryzen as it didn't exactly burst onto the scene issue free, but many of the bugs did get ironed out. And today using a Ryzen 5000 series processor on a 300 series motherboard is a great experience. Where the argument for Intel did make sense was at the high end, though this was only true from late 2017 when the 8th gen series released through to 2019, and this is why all of our top five best CPU videos for that period featured at least one Intel CPU for the no compromise gaming option. The 8th and 9th gen Core i7 range along with the 9th gen Core i9 range were the outright best performance options for high end gaming, and you could argue that because parts such as the 8700K and 9900K are still great for gaming today, they did age very well. However, you could also argue that if those parts were purchased as a no compromise gaming solution, the original owners would have already replaced them with either Zen 3 or an Elder Lake CPU. But of course, no compromise gaming is all about extreme FPS and burning money, so having to buy a new motherboard probably isn't an issue for this category of gamer. But for those of you targeting mid-range or lower-end PC hardware, dropping an additional $1 to $200 US on a motherboard, that really does hurt, especially given that's roughly how much you'd be spending on the CPU. Essentially with Intel, you're getting taxed twice. And this is why combos such as the Ryzen 5 2600 with a B450 motherboard were so popular. Again, I often recommended this Ryzen combo over stuff like the Intel Core i5-9400F. Back in 2019, the Core i5 part was generally a little bit faster for gaming, though not always, mind you, and it got destroyed for productivity workloads. Meanwhile, with the Ryzen 5 2600 enjoying better platform support, it did seem like the superior choice to me, and again, I think looking back, that's now obvious. For example, had you bought the 9400F, your only worthwhile upgrade today, without having to buy a new motherboard, would be the Core i9-9900 or 9900K, and looking on eBay, you can expect to pay over $300 US for one of those in 2022. Again, the R5 5600 is just $175, and it delivers a comparable level of gaming performance to that of the 9900K. 
Alternatively, 9400F owners looking for more performance from Intel would be better off just ditching their current platform for something like a $200 Core i5-12400 on a decent $130-ish B660 motherboard, opposed to buying a secondhand 9900K. That's still a 330 ish dollar upgrade, so nearly 90% more than what AM4 owners will pay for comparable performance with the Ryzen 5 5600. So looking back, I really do think the AM4 platform and all of the Ryzen CPUs it serviced was an amazing achievement by AMD. Sure, it had its fair share of issues, but it's not like the Intel platforms have been faultless. And I think for the most part, the haters were wrong. And I'm sure looking back, many of you would agree. But so it's not just a situation where it's me saying I was right and the haters were wrong. I thought I'd pull some data with the community. I started by asking AMD AM4 owners if they've upgraded their CPU at any point to a faster model, still on the AM4 platform, since many who criticized our recommendations three to four years ago said that was something almost nobody would do. Unsurprisingly, at least to us, half of all AM4 owners who took part in the poll have since upgraded their CPU to a newer AM4 processor. That's an incredible statistic from over 40,000 of you who voted yes or no. I then asked Intel 10th Gen Core series owners the exact same question and found that just 20% of them had upgraded their CPU without replacing the motherboard, less than half of that of the AM4 owners. I also pitched the same question to Intel 8th Gen Core series owners, and just 32% of them had upgraded their CPU on the same motherboard. That's still quite a high number, but it's also a lot less than AM4, and I don't expect the Intel numbers will increase much beyond this point, whereas I do expect more AM4 owners to upgrade, especially those that are still rocking a Zen or Zen Plus processor, as Zen 3 is quite cheap now. It's also worth noting that twice as many people voted on the AM4 poll compared to either the 8th or 10th gen polls, clearly indicating that many more of you have invested in AM4 over the past few years, opposed to one of the various Intel platforms. That being the case, I feel it's extremely important for AMD to commit to a timeframe for AM5 as soon as possible, as they are yet to do so. I really hope that AMD hasn't underestimated just how important their AM4 commitment was for the success of Ryzen. The Ryzen brand has had a tremendous amount of momentum behind it, and they will surely face significantly more competition from Intel for the AM5 generations, and should they copy the Intel release cadence, it would be a massive blow for AM5 and the loss of a key selling point. On that note, I also hope Intel has been paying attention. I hope beyond LJ1700, Intel looks to change their strategy by committing to a future platform for at least four generations, rather than just two, which they've done so for over a decade now. Of course, in that period, they have had a lot less competition than they do now. But if you look at sources such as the Amazon top CPU seller list, AMD has been dominating this for years and they continue to do so right now. Even despite Elder Lake being faster and better value for new system builders, this really does show the impact AM4 has had. So fingers crossed AM5 will enjoy AM4's broad platform compatibility. And with that, I'm going to get back to B350 and X370 testing with the Ryzen 7 5800X3D. So expect that content on the channel pretty shortly. As always, thank you for watching. Like, subscribe, join us over at Floatplane or Patreon uh, if you want to get access to our Discord server, monthly live streams, Q&As, behind the scenes content, a lot of good hardware on box stuff there. So yeah, check that out if you're interested, but if not, perfectly fine. And yeah, just thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time. Mm -hmm.